Wonderful. Well, welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us for this webinar. We are so excited to have two wonderful speakers joining us and we have a fantastic presentation as well as time for discussion planned. Um, and I don't want to take away any of, of Amy's um, thunder and what she's going to share, but uh, you know, much of this work has been really relevant to topics that many of you who are joining us have been seeing both in the media in your own work and in the discussion. And so it's really prompted um, some really work out of interest for us to try to dig in and understand a little bit more about um, what and how information about blood, dried blood spot storage and use is really being shared and communicated with families. And so um, we just are excited to be able to share some of the observations and lessons learned um, that, that we've been able to collect uh, through this project. And with that, if you could go to next slide, a few housekeeping um, items before I introduce our speakers. Um, we do have quite a bit to cover in terms of a, a great presentation, but we also want to leave a little bit of time for discussion and questions at the end. Um, so please, if you do have questions as the presentation is being shared, feel free to include those in the chat box. Both myself and Dr. Ebony from the Expecting Health team will be monitoring that, and then we invite you all to join us in discussion when we get to the point um, of that uh, and share your thoughts and feedback in the chat box. We do hope that it's active and we do um, encourage you all to use it. If you have any technical issues along the way as well, again, both Dr. Ebony and myself are here to help with that. Um, and lastly, please, please stay on uh, to share your feedback through a survey that we have at the end. We will share a QR code with you for that as well. So without further ado, I am so excited to introduce our wonderful speakers. Um, first, I'd like to uh, introduce Ms. Hannah Davidson, and we have had the privilege at Expecting Health of working with Hannah as a genetic counseling intern over the last four to five months. Um, Hannah has uh, her undergraduate degree from the Hampshire College uh, in maternal health, and she is a current second year student at the Johns Hopkins University um, studying genetic counseling and is getting, you know, getting into thesis and all of the exciting things now. Um, and through, you know, through this internship, we've really had an amazing opportunity to not only think about expanding the capacity of genetic counselors in newborn screening specifically, but we have heard, learned a tremendous amount through Hannah's experiences as a doula prior to her training as a genetic counselor. And so it's through this partnership and through this internship that this project has even been possible. And so thank you to Hannah for her dedication and work to this. Um, DC and Baltimore are her current home through the program that she's attending, but she is originally from Massachusetts and um, has spent quite a bit of time in Massachusetts as well. So thank you, Hannah. And next, uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Ms. Amy Gaviglio, who, has, um, who is a genetic counselor by training as well and who spent her entire career working in the newborn screening field. Um, Many of you have, have seen her work previously and um, you know Amy partners with Expecting Health on a number of different projects and many of you as well. She is the founder of Kinetics Consulting um, where she has really been an expert who has provided immense knowledge to genetics, to public health, to newborn screening and to the rare disease community. Um, and I did not know this and many of you who know Amy maybe didn't know this either, but she's an avid golfer and she's been playing for a long time. So thank you to both of you for being here, for being a part of this presentation, for sharing um, for sharing your, your learnings from this work. Next slide, please. And with that, I'm actually gonna turn it over to Amy, who's going to uh, walk through the agenda and give us some context to this work. And then um, we'll hear from Hannah after that. Amy, go ahead. Excellent, can you hear me okay? Sound great. Excellent, so thank you so much, Mariana. Um, Really, this is our outline today, and I will be really starting with the first section, which serves to provide some context for today's webinar. Um, from there, Hannah's going to take over, uh, since this is really uh, her work, and will present her project and findings, including the overarching assessment of information, the methods utilized to achieve this assessment, some of the findings, as well as considerations for the future and next steps. Um, and then, of course, from there, we will end with some time for open discussion and Q&A. Um, so next slide, please. So let's start with uh, the why. And, and I think 
certainly uh, for many of you and looking at many of the, those on the participant list um, who have been in this space for a while, you will of course realize that this is in no way a new conversation. Um, this is a conversation that has been really enduring now for, for nearly 15 years, but it's one that continues to evolve. And I think owing to a number of, of things that we uh, continue to or have newly seen in this space. Uh, so of course we do have ongoing lawsuits in state newborn screening programs uh, as it pertains to residual storage and use of the dried blood spot specimens. Uh, for those of you who pay attention a little bit at the federal level in terms of what's happening with newborn screening, you'll know that the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Reauthorization Act is still uh, on hold. It still has not been reauthorized. Uh, and this is largely due to concerns and considerations around getting consent. Uh, and again, that storage and use of residual dried blood spots after newborn screening. More recently, uh, and I know we have already received some questions on this, is this idea of use of dried blood spots, um, the residual dried blood spots by law enforcement. Uh, the utility of spots in this re regard is growing as we see more and more of these public facing genomic databases as a result of individuals uh, doing a lot of ancestry work uh, or ge you know, genealogy forensic work. Uh, we're also seeing the expansion of dried blood spot use to include things like whole exome sequencing and whole genome sequencing. So really looking more and more into this molecular and fuller broader DNA space. And I already mentioned the evolving availability of public facing genomic databases, but this again, uh, it tends to stem from people doing things like 23andMe, Ancestry.com, um, but now we see a lot more of uh, individuals' genetic information, genomic information really available for, for uses like law enforcement. And certainly I think this shouldn't come as too much of a surprise to many of us is just this growing lack of trust in public health, which has really um, been an, an unfortunate, I think, response to, to the pandemic. And so while, you know, that lack of trust has maybe focused more on infectious disease in the pandemic, I think we're certainly starting to see or continuing to see a trickle uh, effect as it pertains to, to newborn screening. Um, so taking this all into account uh, in, in looking at all of these uh, continuing and evolving issues, uh, this is really what led to this idea of taking another look at how are we communicating this um, how is it different, differing across states and, and what we might do to, uh, you know, continue to try to foster transparency and foster trust in, in a program that I think we all really, really believe in. Next slide. So, you know, what is it necessarily about residual or leftover dried blood spots that has sparked such this intense focus recently? And um, really, whenever I talk to the, about this topic, I kind of continuously come back to this article, which was back uh, in 2009. Um, and I just think it really concisely uh, kind of sums up the, the considerations in that these dried blood spots are quite frankly, a scientific goldmine. There is a lot that we can do with these spots, um, but on the flip side, it, it's also seen by many as an, as an ethical minefield. And so this is really serving as kind of the basis of this dichotomy we find ourselves in as we think about the use of residual dried blood spots. Um, next slide, please. So again, um, many of you will already be very familiar with this, but for those of you who aren't, um, this is just a list of kind of some of the ways that dried blood spots can be really useful. Uh, and I have broken it down in, uh, to kind of six main categories of uses. So um, as it pertains to just even doing our screening ourselves, uh, uh, the screening itself, we can, uh, you know, if we need to look at, relook at results, uh, we can do that without having to bring in the family and get another sample. Um, so this is really helpful for us to store samples for some, um, some amount of time. Um, the sample can be available for other health-related testing. And so I think one of the best and um, um, probably most relevant examples right now is the idea of the ability to test for congenital cytomegalovirus out of these dried blood spots. So, uh, we see uh, families who, whose child has been identified as uh, having a hearing difference, you know, requesting these dried blood spots to see if the cause of that 
um, that hearing loss was potentially due to C uh, congenital sphagnum megalovirus infection. Um, the spots are really one of the only ways uh, over the age of two weeks to be able to look at that. So um, that has been a benefit for some programs. Um, again, that's usually done with consent um, from the family. In some cases, the sample can be available to help identify missing or deceased children, um, especially if there you know, is not a lot left to, um, to identify the child. So this, again, can be really helpful. Um, but more commonly, I think uh, those spots are used for quality control within the lab, making sure that our uh, performance metrics of our testing is uh, as uh, accurate and uh, appropriate as possible. Uh, Certainly, and they're also used to develop new tests. Um, so, you know, we've, we're, we're coming up on the 60th year of, of newborn screening. We started with one test. We're now um, well over 30 tests that, uh, and diseases that we're screening for. And this is largely made possible by the use of residual dry blood spot specimens to ensure that we can even do this testing in that matrix. Um, more controversial is the idea of doing public health studies um, more broadly using these specimens. So uh, from a scientific perspective, this represents a, a really robust sample um, because most children in the United States do receive newborn screening. It is a nice representative birth cohort sample that really minimizes any inherent biases that we often see in other samples. So um, this is another uh, potential use of the dried blood spot. Next slide. So I mentioned earlier on um, that, that uh, there is a, an ethical minefield uh, component to this. And I think we've seen this play out in a number of lawsuits. And these are highlighted here um, to show one kind of the breadth of the lawsuits, but also the time. Uh, you know, I mentioned this is, this is not an, a new issue. This is something that many of us have been dealing with now for um, coming up on 15 years. Uh, by and large, the concerns around the storage and use of dried blood spots have centered around the Fourth Amendment, which is uh, this concept of illegal search and seizure. Um, because newborn screening uh, is considered an opt-out program, informed consent is not obtained. And so um, that, that's kind of playing into this, this idea of the Fourth Amendment. Um, in Minnesota, there was an additional consideration uh, owing to the state's genetic privacy statute and uh, how it dictated the use of anything that contained genetic information, which of course a dried blood spot does contain. And the current lawsuit uh, that is going on in the state of Michigan right now also uh, you know, extends this concept of the Fourth Amendment and more newly to also looking at the 14th Amendment um, in this violation of the uh, parents' right to direct the medical care of their children. And um, so this really gets back a, a lot to, um, you know, to not only whether or not there is consent for the storage and use of dried blood spots, but uh, what those dried blood spots can be used for um, and whether that consent uh, has been truly informed. Next slide. Uh, and, you know, I, I should probably put like a, a trigger warning or something for some for, for these. These can be very difficult to, to look at, but uh, I, I want to say that what I think is newer and what we're seeing more of now in this space is that it used to be very restricted to the states and very um, kind of smaller media, uh, but we are seeing more and more uh, these types of conversations and these types of headlines in the mainstream media. Um, so we are seeing things um, you know, in much more broader media than, than they have in the past. And this just highlights a few uh, examples of some of the headlines that, that uh, really have been popping up in the last uh, two to three years around this space. Um, I do want to indicate that these are certainly media headlines. And as many of us know, any of us who have ever spoken to the media or, or really delved into the media, no, this often resent, uh, represents one viewpoint or one kind of underlying perspective um, and often, you know, certainly does not typically represent the full spectrum of perspectives, including um, from those of us in public health. The next slide, I believe we have a few more examples, um, but again, just kind of showing the breadth and, and here we can see CBS News pick this up um, and, and, you know, the type of messaging and information and considerations that are being put out around this use of dried blood spots um, uh, over time. So I think this is my, my last slide and I hope I was successful in, in kind of setting the tone of, of what led us to uh, 
left Hannah and, and Mariana to really focus on, on this at this time. And, and we're really looking forward to not only talking about what we found, but really thinking about how we move forward um, again with this idea of transparency and trust in mind. So with that, I will hand it to Hannah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amy. All right, let me, there we go. So, you know, moving from that beautiful introduction that Amy gave us to what I specifically did when working on this project and what I'll now share with you, you know, we had a couple of goals in mind. You know, first we wanted to assess how a subset of states are really educating parents around the collection, storage, and usage of dried blood spots with the intention that, you know, by really understanding how a group of states are thinking about this, we could then help to build an, you know, a sense of awareness, communication, and capacity amongst all of us as stakeholders um, in the newborn screening process um, in order to support um, facilitating transparency about this process with families. And you know, we'll talk a little bit more about this as I share some of our findings, but we recognize that you can't always control what is publicly present, presented information. Um, and really the, the broad goal of doing this work is to really help us all understand how to effectively support families who are really kind of like, you know, navigating this complex um, ethical, legal, and social landscape altogether. So, you know, thinking about what we actually did with this assessment, um, you know, we really focused in on public health websites um, as really the um, object of our interest. Um, and then we were specifically looking at public health websites um, based on two different um, uh, facets, both the navigability of the website from what we envisioned as a parent perspective, as well as um, the comprehension of information that is available on public health websites. So more specifically, we selected the public health websites that were um, the web pages centered on newborn screening in 11 states that we selected on the basis of a history of prior lawsuits. You know, as Amy really beautifully summarized, you can see that a couple of those states are um, a part of our assessment. They're the ones that are highlighted in blue. Um, and specifically, we also wanted to include states that have communities that may have a sensitivity to genetic information and privacy, um, in many cases due to potentially a cultural background or cultural representation, think indigenous groups, Amish communities, things like that. And, and I'll also use this slide as an opportunity to just acknowledge that, you know, there will be some times where I am discussing things that we see um, on these web pages. However, I am never going to be using, um, you know, direct quotations that are from a website directly. The, the things I mention are going to be aggregate examples of what you might see on a website. This webinar is not intended to call out any one particular state and how they're communicating this information. It's really an opportunity for all of us to learn together. Um, about some of the different strategies that states are using. And then in terms of what we were measuring when we were looking at these websites, you know, what my approach was to essentially was to essentially put myself in the mind of a parent who's just found out that, you know, this is a process that their baby is going to go through within the first hours of life. Um, and they want to find more information about this. And they're trying to understand what newborn screening is and why they should care about, you know, the um, storage of their baby's blood spots and where they're going. So we thought about that from two different dimensions. First, this navigability piece. So the number of clicks it takes from typing in, you know, insert your state name, newborn screening, to actually getting answers. Um, and then also thinking from there about how easy it is on a website to find information, how readily available is it? If so, where is it housed? Is it on a landing page? Is it on another web page? How many, again, how many clicks within the website does it take to get to that information? And then we dug a little bit into the comprehension piece, thinking about um, how this information is communicated. Again, is it on a web page, is it um, in a PDF brochure or handout? Um, is it in a frequently asked question page? 
We also did some work looking at how readable the information is for um, quote unquote the average person. And we'll talk a little bit more about this, but you know, uh, the sort of literacy level that is recommended for plain communication is between the sixth and ninth grade level. We used the Flesh Kincaid literacy calculator in order to assess readability of different pieces of information about dried blood spot collection and storage and allowable use. Um, but as I'll also discuss a little while later, there are many different ways that we can assess literacy, um, many of which are available in different tools online that we'll share that are freely available for people to use. And then we also wanted to look at what details about dried blood spot storage are shared with families um, with the intent of thinking through whether or not parents can reasonably understand what happens to their child's dried blood spot card after collection. And before I really share the um, you know, findings from our assessment, you know, I really want to reinforce this idea that we are really all working together how to best support families given this very complex landscape. And you know, we don't believe we're really at a point, given what we saw just from these 11 states alone, where we can say these are the best practices on how to talk about this information. Again, this is an evolving landscape that is going to continue to evolve. This is very much a work in progress, and we see this as, you know, it should really be just the start of a broader conversation about communication practices, not only at the state level, but also in the trickle down to you as, um, you know, potential stakeholders, clinicians working with patients, families, and other advocates um, in the newborn screening space. So now I'll turn to our assessment and the way that I wanted to structure our findings with this was to really think about, um, you know, kind of three big questions that you'll see um, on my next slide. So the first is how easy is it for a parent to find information on dried blood spot collection in general? And what we found when we did this project is that it is actually very easy based on the 11 states that we um, were looking at to find dried blood spot collection information. All of the 11 states that we uh, you know, surveyed in this project described dried blood spot collection on their web pages. This information was often widely available, meaning it was on multiple web pages, um, and it was often presented with mixed levels of literacy. Um, and so most of the information that was directed at parents was presented in the late elementary to middle school liter literacy level, which, as I mentioned in the previous slide, is really what we see as a target and is sort of professionally in the health literacy world considered a target for um, the literacy level to the lay audience. Um, states did vary in the availability of resources that were translated into different languages, which is something I'll also talk about a little while later. Um, but you know, what we really ultimately, the big takeaway I would say is that um, this is something that uh, states are effectively communicating on is, you know, what does dried blood spot collection as one integral part of newborn screening actually look like? And so, you know, as I'm talking a little bit about um, literacy levels, I want to give you all an example of what we mean by like an eighth or ninth grade level. Um, and so this is what, again, um, this is not taken from anyone's site. This is just an example considered kind of an aggregate might be very similar to what you may see on a website, um, a State Department of Public Health website, for how we describe the newborn um, screening dried blood spot collection process. Drops of blood are collected by pricking a baby's heel at at least 24 hours after birth. If born outside of the hospital, the screening can be arranged with the baby's healthcare provider, local hospital, or public health nursing agency to be done 24 hours to 48 hours after birth. The blood samples are then sent to the state laboratory for testing. And you know, as you can see, this is fairly clear language. It gives um, you know, the amount of information that um, an individual needs to know about what is going to be a part of that process. Um, and really gives a, again, broad overview of what newborn, um, the dry blood spot collection for newborn screening looks like. So the big takeaway for this first question is that state public health websites do have a strong handle on communicating around the dried blood spot collection process. 
In terms of how easy it is for a parent to find information on dried blood spot storage, however, this is where we can kind of complicate this a little bit. Um, and I, I think that the big takeaway here is that dried blood spot storage information reflects the realities of dried blood spot storage itself. We see a greater variation in communication strategies and information that's shared across states in the 11 states that we looked at. And I also think we can, when we think about the communication aspect, really think back to this idea that a more complex concept requires more sophisticated language. So let's unpack these points a little bit. So in our assessment, 10 out of the 11 states included dried blood spot storage information on their website. And of these 10, two had minimal information. So this might be that they simply put that you know, we store these samples for X number of years. Five had combined information on dried blood spot collection and storage. This could look a couple of different ways. This could be that they might have, you know, storage sort of added as a sentence or two after they sort of describe dried blood spot collection, similar to that blurb that I showed you a few slides ago. Um, it also might be that that's information that is seen in a brochure together or it might be on their web, pa web page on the same web page. Six of those states included information about dried blood spot storage in their frequently asked questions section. Um, and while there is some benefits to this, um, and again, we'll talk about how there's a lot of different reasons why State Department of Public Health websites might make the decisions that they do, it's worth acknowledging that frequently asked question pages can also result in it taking more time to get to this information, particularly if someone is navigating a website, going straight to the web pages that may say, you know, dried blood spot or newborn screening. Um, there were also some other interesting examples of how state websites communicated this information. Some used infographics to organize the information between collection and storage. Um, there were also examples of handouts like a newborn screening keepsake card, which included information about newborn screening, um, as well as storage for dried blood spots. There was also um, some cases where information about um, storage versus, uh, you know, collection of a sample might be distributed between two different websites, you know, one being housed on the public health website, but the storage information being more located on a state biobank website if that was something that a state had up and running. Um, and similarly to like what I mentioned with the um, initial point, there were also various state approaches to translation in non-English languages. You know, it, it would sometimes be that you might have um, information about collection that was translated into one or two other languages, but you may only have information on storage available in English. There were also variations between different states and how many languages they translated their materials into, with some states having information in Spanish, other states having information in Spanish, Mandarin, Vietnamese, uh, French, as well as other languages. But more to this point about you know, the fact that dried blood spot storage is a more complex concept that demands more sophisticated language. You know, the good news is that. As you see from this chart, which shows um, the amount of um, or the literacy level of web pages and different materials that were available on dried blood spot, you know, the same amount of information at the eighth and ninth grade reading levels was available for both dried blood spot storage and dried blood spot collection. And we see that as a great start. You know, that tells us that states are really trying to focus on making this available again at that kind of recommended level um, of literacy. But what resources were available on dried blood spot storage really vary across reading levels, um, it, you know, compared to dried blood spot collection. And as you can see, there were fewer resources available at that sixth and seventh grade reading level to explain dried blood spot storage compared to dried blood spot collection. And compared to dried blood spot collection, there were more resources available at the 10th and 12th grade, as well as college levels that address dried blood spot storage. And, you know, I think there's a lot of different reasons for this, but, you know, hopefully when I sort of show these two examples, um, that it'll make a little bit more sense. So I just want to show you really quickly that, you know, we have the middle school, like sixth grade reading level example of, you know, 
what happens to a baby's dried blood spots? And it just says that the state allows for dried blood spots to be stored for X number of years in a state lab. And again, that's sixth grade reading level. The same kind of information communicated at a college level looks like this. According to current state mandate, residual dried blood spots are permitted to be stored for a maximum of X years in a certified public health laboratory facility. And so there's a lot of reasons why a state might communicate this information at that college level. They may have to communicate that there is a state mandate that requires their dried blood spots to be stored in this way. They may have to acknowledge that it's a certified laboratory facility. And so you can imagine that if these are considerations that we're thinking about with just one sentence, um, that when we're really wanting to clearly communicate and also be uh, beholden to different stakeholders, we have to make complex decisions about how we communicate this information that is a little bit different than describing the process of dried blood spot. Um, you know, I, I'm curious, and you can put it in the comments and we can talk about this a little more later, which of those two descriptions do you prefer you think might be more friendly for parents? And so, you know, just to think about the takeaway for this other question, dried blood spot storage is a more complex concept to communicate to the public than dried blood spot collection. And as a result, the variation in information type and sophistication is going to be reflected in that. Now, you know, thinking about um, our, our last question as a part of this assessment, you know, we're sort of thinking about the idea of what happens to a child's dried blood spot and whether or not a parent can understand that process and what could happen with their child's dried blood spot cards. And, you know, recognizing and caveating that we did not, as part of this assessment, ask any parents explicitly, um, but we were putting ourselves in the mind of parents. We do believe that from what we saw in most cases from those 10 states that mentioned dried blood spot storage, a parent could reasonably infer what is going to happen with their child's dried blood spots. Most states, so about seven of the 10 that mentioned storage of dried blood spots did describe allowable uses in ways that we considered easy to find on their website. However, you know, even though they did describe allowable uses, um, they did vary in the level of detail of if or how parents could potentially opt out of these uses. There were at least three states that clarified which uses were not allowable under state guidelines. In some cases, this information was communicated using legal language. So this might be language directly taken from legal mandate or laws. And then additionally, in other two states, um, really divided this information again between two different areas of their website. So it wasn't all housed in one area. So one example of this might be that they may, you know, talk about, you know, very generally in a parent facing part of the website that um, there are various uses that could, um, their child's dried blood spots could be used for, but then on an FAQ, they may more explicitly address things like the ability for um, uh, law enforcement to use their child samples. So I think the big takeaway about this piece of this project is that there are many different ways to communicate about allowable use. And in many cases, the state context, so this is regulations, laws, practices within the state, legal proceedings really matter. You know, Amy, I think, did a really beautiful job of um, highlighting this, but, you know, I think what we found in our assessment really shows that lawsuits may inform what information is on parents' radar and ultimately what their concerns are and what they're going to be seeking out information around. However, on the public health website perspective, um, it also really informs what information may need to be shared, you know, what may have a legal obligation to be shared with the public. Um, and as a result, it also is going to shape what abilities parents have within their state system to permit or block certain allowable uses. And we really want to recognize as part of this webinar that um, many of you as professionals who are in the newborn screening space, um, whether or not you work as part of the state or as part of a hospital um, or any other organization, really occupy a very challenging role you are really thrust between having to um, 
balance parental needs with the professional and legal obligations that are a part of this newborn screening system. Um, and it also can be really challenging when you're thinking about, okay, you know, where do I direct a parent to get information um, that, you know, is again, like both accessible and comprehensible. And so going from there to thinking about what's next and what we can do with some of this information that we found, you know, we really thought about this in terms of a framework that considers access, literacy, and action in conversation with each other. You know, in terms of access, the states that we saw within this assessment, um, we believe are already making a wide array of information about dried blood spot collection, storage, and allowable uses readily available to families. And of course, you know, we recognize that we did sample within states that um, have a history of lawsuits um, and more assessment is definitely necessary. This is a plug for any students who are, um, you know, on this call or prospective genetic counseling students that I think that a, you know, 50 state assessment of how this information is communicated is necessary and would be a wonderful um, genetic counseling master's thesis project. We also think that, you know, an attention to literacy is very important. Um, when we're talking about dried blood spot storage and allowable use, these are fundamentally more complex concepts to communicate to the public. And we do think that there is certainly a lot that has been done in order to make that information available in accessible ways, but we can all be working to simplify the language that we use to communicate these, to communicate these concepts. Um, and ultimately that will make them more understandable for parents and other lay stakeholders. Um, and I also think that that has a downstream impact of, you know, both um, creating individuals who are informed, um, but also uh, really bringing people into the fold in terms of advocacy around newborn screening. And then, you know, these things really, again, inform action. Um, we need solutions to help maximize and streamline patient and community education on dried blood spot storage and allowable use. I will also put a plug in for the fact that American Public Health Laboratories is developing recommendations regarding how to speak about the legalities of dried blood spot storage and use. Amy um, would be happy to talk a little bit more about that when we get to our Q&A period in a moment. But I also think it's important for all of us to acknowledge that we're not alone in making sense of this very complex territory. Um, you know, what my time at Expecting Health has really taught me is that um, in grappling with this, we're really all in this together. I see this assessment, like I've mentioned a couple times, as a starting point. Um, it's not something that you need to do alone, and there are certainly resources to help with how we think about really effectively communicating around these complex concepts. If you're leaving this webinar really wondering what you can do today um, in terms of how we effectively communicate around this, um, you know, I invite you, you know, I, I did this assessment as part of a internship project, but you do not need to necessarily, um, you know, take on an entire project to find out some of this information for yourself about your state's website um, and the resources available to families that you may serve. Um, there are resources where you can measure your website, your state website's accessibility and readability. If you have hospital resources that are available to families on this um, information, you can also use some of these tools for that. You know, so the WAVE um, web accessibility evaluation tool is something that actually measures the different ways in which a website may or may not be accessible to somebody, um, you know, in terms of navigation and things like that. WebFX has this readability test that is free to use um, that will calculate the readability of a website when you place a hyperlink in there. And then there are also federal guidelines for plain language that, um, you know, I believe thankfully are very um, plainly written and communicated um, out to the public that can be found at plainlanguage.gov. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't mention all of the amazing resources at Expecting Health and Babies First Test, um, including, you know, they have this wonderful handout on plain language principles that um, is shown here. And as we look to the future, I would also be remiss if I didn't mention, you know, the fact that ChatGPT and other similar kinds of artificial intelligence, I do believe are going to change how people think about communication. Um, 
over the course of many of our professional careers. Um, MedPal M is a medically oriented chatbot that is developed by Google. Of course, you know, this is the early stages of a lot of this information being utilized. So it, we can't right now say, oh, you should go and type in something on ChatGPT that will, you know, explain in a, you know, readable manner, you know, information about these concepts. But we are already seeing people, you know, think through, okay, like, I put that into chat GPT, I see what comes out and I think about how I can tweak that with my expertise. And I think we're again, going to see more of that over time within the health communication world. And then, you know, of course, specific to genetics, there's been the development of these genetics with specific chatbots like GIA, the Invitae, as well as GeneFacts. But I think it's again, not, you know, outside of the realm of possibility, that these tools end up being of use to us as we think about really communicating about these very complex concepts to parents who may see a headline and wonder what is going on with newborn screening. And again, you know, how do I weigh that information with the benefits of this? And that's, you know, really the closing of my discussion of our results. And I would love to now open it up. I see that we've had a couple of comments throughout this presentation. Um, I'm really curious what you're taking away from this talk and how these findings from the assessment make you all think about your own state's resources for families. So, you know, thank you all for taking the time to listen to both me and Amy as we shared about this important work. and. I'm just excited to hear what you all have to, sh to share and say in your insights. So I'm gonna jump in as people are starting to think about and respond to those questions. Please feel free to share your feedback again in the chat, box, chat box. Um, It's definitely been active and interesting and I'll, I'll take a moment to try to kind of summarize some of the key points that have come up in the discussion there already. But first, before I do that, thank you both to Hannah and Amy, um, you know, I think this was a great example of, you know, what started as, as what we saw as a need really grew into a robust kind of project and analysis. And so I thank you to Hannah for, for you and for the work that you've done, not only to complete the analysis, but to share that information today. I think this, you know, as, as those of you listening in, it's extremely relevant. It's a different way of thinking about it. And I think to Amy's earlier points of, really aiming to build trust and transparency, um, this is a great first step in doing that. And it's going to take the entire system working together to really start to think about ways that we can build on communication. Um, so a, a couple of things, and I can see that comments are coming in, so I'll try to keep up. You know, I think two of the main things that I'm seeing from the questions and discussions in the chat are certainly the different tools that are available to, just, to support not only public health websites, but really other forms of communication as well to really think about that readability aspect. And so, you know, several of those tools were shared, but that's, you know, that's the first step is, as, as Amy even said in the comments, you know, it's one thing to make sure that it's something that the general public can understand. It's a completely nether level to make sure that the information is really getting disseminated and distributed to all of the sources. So we certainly welcome thoughts and ideas of other forms of communication. We recognize that public health websites may not be the first place that families are going um, for this information. And, you know, what are the other places that those of you who are looking into this are going? And how, as a newborn screening system, can we really work together to think about improving the communication in other areas outside of public health websites? Um, so definitely, you know, open to Amy or Hannah, if you have Initial thoughts about that and welcome others to join in in the chat box as well. Yeah, I mean, I can take a first step. So I, I think it's such an important point to, and something we always struggle with in newborn screening where we may take just a ton of time developing these beautiful, robust uh, education initiatives and then we stick them on a website never to be seen <laughs> by the people who we want to see. So um, I really appreciate that comment and, and you know, would look to, to Oh, sorry. I mean, where are yeah, where are families going for this information? Um, how do we make sure that we're going to families instead of expecting families to come to to us, especially in a period of time where there's so much information that that people are trying to get at? So, um, 
I, I, I love that comment so much because I, I think it's not just about creating the perfect language. It's about making sure it's getting to the people too. And, and um, we, we have to just think better. Absolutely. Thanks for that, Amy. Um, I'm going to go back just a second because this is an easy question to answer. Um, Hannah, could you, there was a question about the timing of when um, the assessment of the websites was taking place. Do you mind providing a little more insight on that? Absolutely. So this was happening, um, basically my internship started in November. So this occurred uh, for most of December of last year is when we were going through an assessing stage and then really discussing the findings that I saw um, over the course of late December into early January. And so that's another thing to acknowledge is that, you know, we're, we're really talking about like a, a, you know, point in time, which is also one of the challenges that I think families navigate, you know, they, again, you know, I really appreciate some of the cons or the comments that have been made about the fact that, you know, this may not always be something that's on families radar and there's a lot of work that we need to do in terms of opening up the conversation at that prenatal point in time. This is something I think a lot about as both a doula and a genetic counselor or, you know, a genetic counselor in training. Um, but, you know, even the things that, you know, a state Department of Public Health website may develop um, could be very different between like if a parent by chance were to be looking up information about this prenatal aid versus if they do a complete overhaul of their website several months later. So Hannah, it looks like we have a question as well in the chat box. I'm going to read it out loud for you. Um, it says that Hannah, thank you for sharing your work. I would be interested in knowing if anyone has looked um, what had been published by the loss. Oh, sorry, this may not be directed specifically to Hannah. So Hannah or Amy, feel free to jump in. But um, it would be interested in knowing if anyone has looked what had been published by the lawsuit states prior to legal issues. I believe that transparency is critical, but I'm wondering how much how much website resources being available would impact or pacify potentially someone who has privacy concerns. Amy, do you? Have thoughts on that? <laughs> oh, that's such a good question um, and a really good point. I mean, I, I think um, it's hard to say, you know, I mean, there are some individuals who no matter what information is provided, how it's provided, how clear it is, will not will not be okay with it, you know, and and, and I think there's needs to be some acknowledgement of that, that um, this is such a, an interesting point where, or, place that we're in where I don't know that we're in a position where we'll ever be able to appease everybody because there will be people who think that should be freely available. There are people who think that it should be available to law, law enforcement because we should try to catch these individuals who have committed crime. You know, I mean, so I, it's a fair question that I, I don't think, and I'm sorry, I'm sitting in the hospital lobby right now, so I apologize for the background noise, but um, I think it's one of those things where we have to try to be as transparent and open and, and ultimately allow families to make a choice and make sure they have choices in, in this space. Uh, I think that's the best we can do. I don't think that there's anything, we, you can never mitigate lawsuits. People can sue no matter what, but, but what can we, you know, what can we do to make sure that it feels like we're being open, transparent and honest. I don't know even if I'm answering the question because it's such a good question of, <laughs> of uh, you know, how powerful are words and for some people they'll be powerful and some they won't. Yeah. And I think, I also think it's, it's both how powerful are words and, and also I think part of what you're getting at Mark is like how, how powerful are, you know, words from a state department of public health website. Um, you know, because I hold a lot of folks who are in public health and esteem. And like Amy mentioned, you know, we are navigating challenges with mistrust of public health systems. And I think this really does go back to, I really appreciate Ashley's um, comment underneath that, um, this idea of the collaboration between all the different experts. Um, and, you know, even though this project did focus on, you know, public health communication strategies, I think this is where building multidisciplinary um, stakeholder 
work is incredibly important because, you know, maybe a parent is not going to like be able to like, you know, put a lot of weight in what they read on a Department of Public Health website, but then maybe they're going to talk to one of their friends who, you know, found quite a bit of benefit in, you know, what it was like to go through the newborn screening process. And that is going to be the thing that, you know, makes them put value in this um, and alleviate some of that skepticism or mistrust, or it's having, you know, an OB who they really respect, who provided really good care for them during their pregnancy, who communicated about this effectively. That's really the thing that, um, you know, it helps them in alleviating some of these concerns. Like it's really all these different levels of this, of this process. Yeah, one thing I was going to add in that relates to this discussion, and we haven't really heard it yet, is, is sort of timing of this communication and information. Um, you know, and often it, when we're talking about education across the newborn screening system, we often talk about meeting families where they are with the information that they need at, at, at the time that they need it. And so as it relates to information and communication around dried blood spot storage and use, you know, again, that sort of, there's not necessarily a clear answer yet of when is the most ideal time to learn about that information? When will it be most relevant, most useful, most meaningful? And so I think that plays into the communication. And, you know, what we know from, from our own work and from other work is that it takes more than one time as well. And so it may be communication points about this prior to newborn screening, at the time of newborn screening, after newborn screening is occurring, um, and, and how that information is received and used, you know, may, be, may vary based on what's going on in that individual family's um, reality at that moment in time. And so I think that that's a big part of this discussion as well, that as we think about increasing transparency and trust, that's going to take communication at multiple points with multiple strategies. I want us to continue the conversation, but really quickly, I'm going to just move to the um, post webinar evaluation and hope that people can still share things in the comments. Um, yes, the, the comments are fantastic. Please keep them coming. And we certainly appreciate that this is just an introduction discussion and conversation and that we could probably talk for you know many hours, if not days, about this. And this is, as Hannah and both Amy have mentioned, kind of just a beginning and just a starting point. So, you know, if we don't get to, if you don't have an opportunity to share and you have thoughts later, we most certainly are open to further discussion and and partnership on this. Um, and we you know appreciate all the work that is going on um, to try to reach a place of some guidance on language and communication around this topic. And so, you know, certainly if this creates more questions for you or more interest, um, I'll share again our contact information. Please reach out to us. We are more than welcome to continue the discussion and think about how to apply not just the lessons that we've learned through this work and that Hannah's highlighted today, but what are those actionable next steps that as a community we can work together to accomplish. Um, fantastic. I'm also uh, going to put in the chat box, if you're having any trouble with the QR code for any reason, a link to the survey as well. And we really do appreciate your feedback and, and input there as it does help us think about future topics as well as how to improve our webinars. And, you know, as Mariana mentioned, um, you know, I and other folks who've spoken today are more than happy to continue this conversation. And I'll just put up our contact information here. Um, look forward to hearing from all of you and your and your thoughts. Sorry, just reading some of the messages. Um, I, I'm sure you all are as well. So um so with that, I would like to conclude by, again, thanking Hannah um, for tremendous effort and work, um, again, not only in the assessment itself, but today and sharing this with the entire community and to Amy as well um, for her continued just expertise and perspective that she shares with us and with all of you as well. So um, again, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. 
Um, thank you for joining. Thank you for sharing your perspectives and your feedback. Um, we truly do uh, use that and, and you know work together to continue to move this in a forward direction. So we hope everybody has a wonderful rest of your day. And um, thank you. Thank you for joining us and thank you for being here.